Hello, I'm Robert Cohen, and this is Penn Presents Rocky Mountain Writers. Today we have with us Ronald Sukunek, the author of 98.6. 98.6 is published by the FC Collective? No, FC2 Black Ice Books. So it used to be called Fiction Collective. This has been going for 25 years and has gone through several metamorphoses. And uh, the latest metamorphoses, uh, metamorphosis is uh, in Illinois, normal Illinois, because we're so abnormal. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it has an imprint called Black Ice Books, which some people may be familiar with. And, and the, uh, therefore, the first part of the name was shortened to FC, and second version two, some, some people <laughs> say squared, FC2 Black Ice Books. Well, uh, let's talk about it. Uh, 98.6, of course, refers to the temperature of the human body, normal right. temperature. Right. And uh, this is a novel, a novel which uh, reminds me of uh, in some ways of E. Cummings in, in, the, in some of the ways it's written, but a novel which is really a play on the English language, greatly. Uh, but before we get into it, let's talk about you. You are an instructor, a professor at the University of Colorado. Yes. And uh, how long have you been there? Uh, well, uh, I think it's well over 20 years now, uh, but I have several, several lives. I'm also a publisher. I, I do American Book Review, and uh, uh, I help run this organization, which is an author-run publishing house. It's the oldest author-run publishing house in the United States, and probably the most prominent. Uh, it was started 25 years ago in New York by uh, or writers who, like the people who started United Artists, wanted to uh, take uh, hold of their own artistic fate and uh, because they weren't getting the kinds of books published that they wanted to publish. We, we had all published with the uh, major presses before, uh, some of us very prominently with some success, but we found that the, our more extreme books couldn't be published anymore. Now that situation is even worse since uh, six international conglomerates on just about all of the big presses. So all, all and, and also everything else in the entertainment business. And you continue to function as a collective? Yes, we do. And uh, I should speak to you about some of my books. You should, <laughs> absolutely. But we, uh, we, we publish only books that uh, can't, for stylistic uh, or content reasons, be published with the uh, commercial presses. And it's very hard to publish. I have to warn you, it's very hard to publish with FC2, I have myself have been turned down twice. By your own collective? By my own collective, and I've had to publish with other presses. But on the other hand, it's very good to publish with, the, uh, with our press because the books are kept in print forever. And this book has been in print for 20 years, and 21 now, I guess. And this, this particular edition is the fifth edition, which uh, now has an author's preface. The other editions didn't. Now, tell, tell, tell me something about yourself. Uh, where are you from? Where were you born? I was born in Brooklyn. But I've spent half my life in the West, uh, Western United States. I, I went uh, more or less directly from Brooklyn uh, to uh, Southern California. And I uh, went to college there for a while, and then I went back east. But I always traveled back out uh, for films and stuff like that. And then uh, I started, after, after about uh, uh, 10 years of trying to make a living as a writer, not very successfully, uh, I started teaching regularly. And I started teaching in California and then came to Colorado. So uh, I have been here for, uh, that is, uh, at, at the Continental Divide or further west for about half my life. But I keep strong ties to. Uh, New York, and I also was part of time in Paris. You, know, you don't sound like you come from Brooklyn. Well, I used to. <laughs> you did? Yeah. Because my, I remember my parents, when I came out, came back in from outside, would always try to correct my pronunciation, because I was talking like, uh, you know, Brooklynese. Yeah. And uh, it was a pretty dense Brooklynese. Now I can not quite understand the variety of Brooklynese. What, it's changed anyway. It's got a little Haitian thrown in <laughs> and, and uh, Chinese. It's, it's and quite a cultural mix these days. Yeah. No more toity toid and toid. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's very hard to understand. As like, I've got a lot of Hispanic thrown in now. Well, now, you, where did you go to school in uh, California? 
Uh, I was in this little uh, scholarship school which had about 13 or 14 students in it called Telluride Association. The Telluride Association is actually based at Cornell where I went later, but ha has these branches. It has one out in the California desert called Deep Springs where the author William Volman went. I never liked that place because uh, uh, you had to stay there for three years, and you weren't allowed to smoke, drink, and there were no women around. So you began hearing the voice of the desert. <laughs> <laughs> what else was there to do? But my, uh, my place, the, which we called Pasadena Branch, was in Pasadena and then right in the middle of Los Angeles uh, in its second phase. And unlike the rest of the organization, which was very conservative, elite conservative, uh, was extremely radical. It was run by a radical Quaker. And we had lots of COs and rebels. And so in fact, my conscientious objectives. Yeah, my roommate uh, was Norman Rush, who's now a very well-known writer, was pulled out by the FBI and sent to prison for three years. What year was this? This was uh, 1952. Uh, they were uh, conscientious objectors against the war in Korea. Yeah, well, Korean well, conflict. Nor me. Norman was not only a conscientious objector; he refused even to become a conscientious objector. Uh, he was called a non-registrant. He refused to register for the draft. So uh, I had that kind of. And then I went to the Cornell branch, which I hated, and got immediately got kicked out. And then I almost got kicked out of Cornell. Oh, that's a because <laughs> because uh, uh, this is starting right away. We started a literary magazine called the Cornell Writer, and I was the fiction editor. So naturally, in my uh, first edition, I had a story of mine because why else start a literary magazine? And it, w it was confiscated at the post office, sent to the president, who immediately tried to expel me. And why was it confiscated at the post office? Well, it had this vaguely erotic tone. We're talking 1953, remember? And Nabokov was there, for example. He couldn't get Lolita published in this country. It had to be published in Paris by Olympia Press. Gerodius. Yeah, Gerodius, yeah. So, uh, in fact, uh, he helped save me there. I, I didn't know that. I read in his biography. He was working behind the scenes to because they wanted to kick me out on obscenity charges. And it was amazing. This was like the McCarthy era, right? You could still smell the Rosenbergs burning. And uh, uh, we went through various committees with lawyers, the university lawyers, not my lawyers, and, and, and deans and, and professors. And they, the arguments were like, well, maybe goddamn isn't so bad because it's not spelled with an N, it's spelled with an M, so it's like Boulder Dam. And maybe the bird shit was one of the words they objected bird, to. They bird shit, goddamn and bird shit. Bird shit, the, the argument was, my defenders were saying, well, it's only animal dookie. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I was saved from that, but I've, uh, I've been actually FC2, is, I'm under the gun again because FC2 is now being investigated uh, by Congress for exactly the same thing. Well, wait, wait. The collective, the publishing collective FC2 that published this book yeah. is being investigated by whom? By a uh, subcommittee of Congress, uh, which uh, is going to decide on whether or not to fund the NEA, National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, so, so you're part of the, uh, the moral degeneracy that is endangered? Apparently. NEA? The, well, the charge is uh, that the books are uh, explicitly uh, erotic and that they make fun of politicians. I never knew these things were against the law. I see them on television all the time. I mean, I'm, I've got cable. I've got well, satellite we're, now. We're actually swimming in, in pornography, you know. Yeah. And the, actually, the, the, the uh, campaign against the uh, uh, collective is foundering, against the NEA, is foundering on the rock of the collective because it's so unimpeachably literary and high quality that they really can't pin anything on us. I want to read uh, some of the... Uh, something about this book. Uh, this is from the back of the book. A group of people trying to contend with the failure of hope took place at the end of the 60s, withdraws from what they call the dynasty of the million lies, and creates a settlement in the woods of the far west. These refugees from our culture, trying to live a healthy, normal life as pioneers of a latter-day frontier, find they are forced to pay heavily for their retreat in terms of sexuality, death, and insanity. The novel consists of three parts, Frankenstein, The Children of Frankenstein, and Palestine. Now, uh, this is a fascinating description, and uh, it has been reviewed. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of the little reviews here. Uh, this is from the New York Times, full of color, energy, life. Uh, the Saturday Review, a hilarious outburst of wild comedy. Book World, a celebration of life. The New York Times Book Review, 
the very best sort of experimental writing by one of the very best writers of it. Now, these, these are very good things uh, and make one want to read the book, but I'd like from your to see here, what caused you to write the book? What are you trying to say in the book? Well, first of all, I have to say it's not experimental writing. It's, I don't like the phrase experimental writing because but that, that's really uh, publishing code for it doesn't sell. <laughs> and uh, it, it also gives the book a kind of tentative air, like this may work or maybe it won't. We'll see at the end of the experiment. What it is, I call it innovative writing in the sense that it departs from the uh, prescribed forms of fiction and creates its own form. And I tried to create forms that in general correspond with people's experience, I, I feel, more so than uh, the uh, conventional form of the novel, which I consider really literary formula. So, so you, f you consider yourself essentially a realist? Of course, yes. But, uh, and realism, I, I consider a literary formula, as I said. But this, this book uh, is about a commune. By the way, I've never lived in a commune. I would never be caught dead living in a commune. Or if I were on a commune, I'd probably be caught dead. <laughs> uh, but uh, because I hate group situations, I hate, I hate writers' colonies and that kind of thing. But I've visited communes, you know, and had friends in communes, and I did research on communes. The commune is actually a very old American uh, kind of thing. There's a story by Hawthorne about it. Uh, a sex commune. Did you know that? No, no. Uh, and which is which is invaded by the Puritans and, and destroyed. Uh, it's called Miracle of Marymount or something like that. By Nathaniel Hawthorne. By Nathaniel Hawthorne. Yeah. And then there's the, the, the Hawthorne actually wrote a book about uh, a commune, uh, which he helped support. He didn't live on it either, but he helped support it, which is a fa one of the famous. There was a commune movement in the 19th century. It was one of the famous uh, communes. And uh, I forget the name of the book now, uh, but it was a, a good, interesting novel. So this is a kind of traditional American theme and a traditional American uh, novel in a certain way uh, because it deals with part of our heritage, really. Anyway, about the book, it, it deals not only with American communes, but it goes like this. Frankenstein is the image for America during the Vietnam War. Technology run wild and bureaucracy run wild and so on. And uh, so the first section of the book, Frankenstein, is, is strictly documentary. There, it's collaged from articles in the press and from other uh, uh, realistic sources like uh, um, recorded conversations, uh, or dreams that I transcribed and stuff like that, collaged together to show the state of America at the time, which was a little, pretty scary. And then the second part, uh, The Children of Frankenstein, shows th these young people trying to move out of that culture and create their own uh, kind of um, ambiance, their own uh, isolated, uh, uh, cut-off kind of paradise situation, which of course doesn't work. They find they're invaded by the same things that have invaded the rest of the culture because these things are not only around them and the things around them invade them, but also these things are in them. So the commune collapses. And then the, the, uh, the third section, Palestine, is about Israel. But it's about Israel before I'd ever been there. And it's about an imaginary Israel where they have people ride giraffes and they have the country is filled with canals and, and, and so on. And it's, it's a fabulous Israel. What it is, it's, it's an imaginary solution to all the problems. But imagination, you know, contains the element of hope. We, we imagine uh, what we want to imagine. And so I imagine a reconciliation between the Arabs and the Jews. Everybody's living at peace. They hug one another. Robert Kennedy, who had been assassinated by that time, was still alive and wandering around doing good things, which I don't know if he ever did in his life, actually. So it's all an imaginative utopian fantasy. But utopianism is in line with the, uh, the heritage of communes in this country. Uh, the, um, today, of course, culture in the news. Yeah. But there's a, a commune is not a cult, necessarily. 
No, but it, it borders on. I mean, it's hard to see. I think the, the communes that survived from the 60s are somewhat cult-like because it's hard to imagine how an isolated situation like that can perpetuate itself without some kind of strong uh, inherent belief that's different from the, the general, the general uh, beliefs of the going culture. There's got to be a reason for people to detach themselves from the culture, or try to, yeah. and, and live in their own microculture. Yeah, their own world, basically. It's an unhealthy situation. You think a commune is an unhealthy situation? I think situation? so, yeah. But you've never lived on one. Well, that's why. <laughs> uh, if, if, would you say that you are, in effect, a, a, an observer of our society who is trying to give prescriptions for a better society, or just of an observer who is describing society as they see it? Uh, I think uh, I, the, the amount of invention I do is minimal. Uh, I just select things from the, from the culture and present them. Do you have a prescription for a better society? No. Uh, I'm not sure that society will get better. But I have, I have uh, things that I, that I uh, harp on. I mean, I guess uh, basically uh, injustice and corruption and so on. Are you for or against them? I'm for. <laughs> <laughs> in in, um, in, in 98.6, why the title 98.6? Uh, because it, it uh, refers to uh, a healthy norm of human behavior, which I'm not so sure exists, and which uh, the people who established the commune tried to arrive at, but uh, can't really manage to maintain. Well, the, the, it takes the temperature of the culture, put it that way. <laughs> you, it, there seems to be a, a, a tone of hopelessness. Uh, well, there's a tone of hopelessness finally when the commune collapses, but it begins with great hope and optimism. And the book itself ends in its imaginative integration of everything that's been going on with a hopeful note. And so therefore you hope for this, the, you personally as the author. Well, we all have a vision of what life would be if it were perfect. And what is your vision? Well, everybody loves one another, sex is terrific. Uh, good whiskey, uh, good wine, good drugs, nice places to live, beautiful landscape. That's what my version of Israel is like. Your, your Israel of the dream. Yeah. I once had the, uh, the uh, some people don't get that, what I'm talking about in that, uh, in that uh, section. Uh, but I, I once had the opportunity to uh, read the whole thing, which is quite long in Jerusalem. You mean, you mean you did a public reading I of that I did a public section. reading in Jerusalem. Everybody caught it immediately. <laughs> it was a great <laughs> success. Because they knew where they were at, and they knew, you know, they knew what, what this was about. So you have been to Israel after writing Yeah, book. I was writer in residence at Hebrew University for a while, for six months. And you got a favorable response to the dream Israel that you had Yeah, because about. they got the joke, you know. What was the joke? Well, the joke was that the, what was presented is nothing like what actually exists there. But still, there's a germ of truth because, of course, Israel, when it was founded, was like a big commune, the kibbutzes and everything, and it began with the same impulse. Yeah. The, in fact, uh, there, is, there are vestiges of that still today in Israel, yeah. in, in the kibbutzes. Yeah. I've been there many times. Uh, I have a certain advantage of you because at the age of three or four, I lived on a commune. Uh, the Sunrise Colony uh, on the Old Brothers Farm outside of Stacken on Michigan mm -hmm. that uh, my Uncle Joe, Joseph Cohen, had founded. Uh, and I think it lasted for four or five years before it disintegrated. Uh, because as you describe in the book, uh, the problem is that the people who form the commune bring with them the culture that they came from. Mm -hmm. And they're living surrounded by it and it has an inexorable effect upon them. But do you think that it is possible for people to join in a cooperative, supportive, cultural integration of some kind, even if just on a small level, a few hundred people? Yeah, of course I think it's possible. I think it happens. I think universities ideally are supposed to be like that, for example. Uh, but uh, as soon as they start cutting ties, or trying to cut ties, because they can, can't be cut from the rest of the culture, then I think they either collapse or become authoritarian. Uh, so, if, if you uh, were to 
make a statement about this book? I mean, what is the basic statement of the book? It's not totally cynical. It's not totally hopeless. There is a, an element of hope and prescription. Well, I don't know if there's a basic statement. The basic, basic metaphor is that uh, it tries to establish about the culture. For example, uh, the Frankenstein metaphor is very important in the book. Um, at the end of the book, uh, Albert Einstein appears, for example, but, but in, a, in a malign kind of version uh, as, a, as a kind of uh, uh, mad scientist. Albert Einstein is a mad scientist. Yeah. In what way? Well, uh, I mean, uh, let me go back a little bit. There's, there's a, uh, a scene, there's a, an acid trip scene. And, uh, LSD. Yeah. And uh, in the acid trip, the hero discovers or envisions or has a hallucination of these um, hands. And all he can really see of the hands, these gigantic hands, all I can see is the fingernails, and they're like claws, and they have V-stripes on them. And uh, it turns out, I discovered later, that when Indians or Native Americans, as we sometimes call them, uh, do peyote trips, uh, I read that the Wakantanka, uh, the god appears, but only he's only manifested with, by his claws or fingernails. So I thought that was pretty amazing. And it was sort of a peyote trip. So it was like, like uh, in fact, it was instigated by Carlos Castaneda, who I knew at the time, whose peyote trips were, uh, he made famous in, in his book, in his Don Juan books. So uh, he is a, a godlike figure, but he gets perverted at the at the end of the at the end of the book into a kind of Frankenstein figure who becomes menacing. And then he merges. This is a book that, that morphs and, and changes and so on. He merges with the Einstein figure uh, who becomes the mad scientist, uh, who becomes uh, then a benign figure, a benign father figure, and uh, is, is uh, presented along with Golda Meir, who becomes, becomes a uh, benign mother figure because it's all part of the benevolent fantasy of the book. Wait, would you uh, like to read us something from the book? Okay, I'll read uh, some sections from the comedy. I'll, I'll read uh, two sections which show how the commune comes into conflict with outside forces. Okay. And uh, one in the middle which uh, shows the ideal which okay, is we don't have a lot of time, but... Oh, well, in that fast. case, I'll only, I'll only read one of them. Okay. Uh, how much time do we have? Oh, let's uh, just read away, and I'll tell you. Okay. I'll give you ch opportunities to stop me when I'm finished. The okay. Altair knows damn well that he's being perverse. On the other hand, Paul knows that as soon as Altair walks into the food stamp office, he's going to freak everybody out. And that he thinks if he makes the first concession, and changes his clothes, he's heading down a one-way street that leads to wearing a tie and living in the suburbs, because that really gets results. Either that or a power trip like he's a freak, but he can really deal with them cats, because he is one of them cats, which is completely beside the point. The point is that Altair used to be an addict. He needs to stay high. He's not coming down even for food stamps. What Altair is saying is that he needs an intermediary, an agent, or whatever, a lawyer. OK, so Paul gets the van, and they drive into town. In the food stamp office, Mr. Stamp explains that under the new regulations, only families can get the stamps. Mr. Stamp is a redneck, that is, a citizen of Earth. For an Earth man, he's tolerant, explaining that Altair's bunch didn't register as a family. They registered as a planet. And planets aren't eligible. But if they want to register as a family, that's all right. But Altair, who can be perfectly practical, gets paranoid and resentful confronting Earth's red tape and the general bad vibes coming from the Earthmen in the office and says, they can't register as a family. Why not? Because my old lady Cassiopeia took Lyra, Libra, and Lepus and moved into Mizar's yurt where she's bawling Betelgeuse and Canopus. So as far as I'm concerned, we're not really a family anymore. Paul gets Altair out of there 
someone else from Krypton can come another time. It's not so much Mr. Stamp as two guys with mangy beards and eyes like pickled onions staring at them in the edge of saying something quiet, irreversible, and disastrous. Just before he takes the turn into the settlement, he gets a glimpse of them on motorcycles in the rearview mirror. That night, Paul hears the guttering of motorcycles, the distant slow rumble of columns of motorcycles somewhere in the hills. i read another very oh, short that's fine. sentence. That, that's enough because okay. <laughs> I'd love to do a show of just you reading. Uh, right. You read very well. Uh, do you have a new project? Well, I, I just, I'm working on a manuscript of a book uh, about the Jewish tradition, which is non-religious non Judaism, but, but uses the religious tradition. It's really about the golden calf, the myth of the golden calf, uh, Aaron's golden calf. What about it? Well, it's it, uh, presented in different settings as a, a corrupt symbol of something that uh, is corrosive and, and evil and needs to be dealt with in some way or other. And uh, you're doing this as a novel? That's a novel. Uh, and then uh, I have a, a book that, uh, in, a, in a certain way, is, is about the uh, Jean Benet murder, but uh, by accident, because it happens to be about the, uh, the uh, ambiance, the world, the, uh, the culture out of which something like that could happen. And uh, I, I believe, frankly, that fiction has a prophetic side. And of course, it did happen. So all I had to do was uh, put in a reference to the Jean Benet murder. It's obviously about the Jean Benet murder. It's a kind of utopian, not, not utopian, a science fiction detective story uh, takeoff on that. Well, the writer as prophet, the writer as sage, uh, is something which has happened for a long time. And I think that you uh, definitely are in that category. I want to thank you. We've been uh, interviewing Ronald Sukunik the author of 98.6 and 11 other books, and look forward to having you on the show again. Thank you very much. Thank you.